All right, so let's get started. Uh, did we close the door? Okay, we got it. Okay, thanks. So, good morning. Nice to see all of you here. Thank you for coming here. Uh, my name is Aarti Rati. I am a CFO uh, with Book and Street. A CPA by background, uh, been in the finance and uh, finance and M&A world for the last 15 plus years, you know, different places, different organizations, and then eventually decided to get towards a startup environment and startup space to use the skills and experience which I built over time. So that's my quick background, Charles. Uh, yeah, Charles Richmond. Um, I also work at Booking Street with Arthi. Um, I'm a financial and operations analyst, and I do a lot of our stock plan administration um, over at Booking Street. Um, I'm a recent OSU grad. This is my first job out of college, and yeah. Excellent. All right, so what's Book and Street, right? Just to give you a little bit of background of where we come from and why we're doing this uh, this uh, particular session with all of you. Book and Street is a firm, it's a financial and strategic advisory firm based out of Columbus, Ohio. We specialize and we support all the startups in the Midwest region. We have clients nationwide, but our specific focus is in the Columbus Midwest region, and we cater to all growing businesses. So if you're a founder who has an idea, who's ready to start off, we work with you till the time you're scaling or you're one where your body scales, but you're going to the next jump, right? Okay, my series A, my series B. How do I think through that? That's where Book and Street comes and supports you guys as an extended part of your team to think through the finance, think through your strategic advisory, think through equity compensation, think through your talent growth. So that's where we come and our experts come and support the startup founders with that. We're not a typical accounting firm, we're not a typical bookkeeping firm, we're definitely not bookkeepers, and not typical accounting, but we're stuck with you for life. We come, we help you scale, and then we are, when you're ready to move on, we transition you to your own internal team. That's kind of our model. We don't want to be lifelong partner, like lifelong with you, you know? So that's our whole group, because we want all our founders and startups to grow and scale. <clears throat> so that's how our model is set up. So what brings us here, correct? One of the three pillars which Book and Street offers, correct? One is the financial advisory, second is the equity compensation, and third is the, uh, the talent growth and talent services. No, equity compensation. So what is equity compensation and how do we support startups, correct? So let's start talking about that. So stock option. So you all have come here to understand about equity compensation. So let me ask you this. What is a stock option for you guys? What does it mean to you? Anybody can. Uh, I would say it's a essentially a pool of money that you have the option to buy the stock at specific criteria at some point in the future. Very good. Excellent. You get a candy. Look at that. We love giving candy in Book and Street. We get a big candy. The whole group of us, we're like, we're, we're 14 of us and we love candy. And that's what we do with all our people we talk to, with like candy. So anything else, any other perception, any other thoughts about stock option anybody else has or has read about it? Or questions which came to your mind when you decided to sign up for the session that said, okay, this is what I know about it and this is what I, you know, would like to know. Feel free to ask or say it here. I usually think of, this is probably wrong, but I usually think of stock as um, a way to measure the, the value of the company. Um, just like it's financial work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that is also true. Yeah, a lot of people kind of misunderstand. Yeah, that's, what, that's interesting you say that, correct? So we just came up a project for equity compensation for somebody and we were distributing the awards. The person comes up with a question saying, okay, how do I know who's going to buy the stock? At, you know, and what price? Will they buy it at this, at this price? The funny thing is, it is a private company, so it's not a common stock, it's like a publicly traded company. So it's different when you think about stock for a private company versus, you know, a public company that's traded daily on the NASDAQ, correct? So it's interesting, some questions like that do come up, right, when they associate the value of it, which is a correct definition of stock, but not, it doesn't give you the full picture of it, let me just say it that way, okay? All right, so what is stock option? Stock option, to your point, what you just said, is absolutely correct. Stock option is a right, a contractual right for you as an individual, you as an employee, you as a consultant of the company to be able to own the shares of or the equity of the company at a future date, but at the price as of today when you are given the option. So why is it a, a very, why, it does, why do startups use it a lot? The reason is if you're starting your company today, correct? And right now you're the only owner and you have all your stock and it's valued at zero right now and you decide to get somebody on uh, or hire a consultant or get another advisor on your board and you want to give them some kind of option because cash flow is always limited, right, for a startup company. The best way to you know, give them a compensation is options. So then you'll say, okay, what is the value today? So you decide, okay, it's only zero, but then I join you in your company, in your business because I know I believe in your company and I know it's going to go up 10 times. 
So that is the reason why it's so attractive to startups because of the potential value growth it has associated with the stock which you were just talking about. So you know, so that's basically what it is. Um, why do companies issue them? Companies issue them. The biggest reason what we have seen with startups, the reason they issue it is basically to your point when you're getting other founders into your board, you know, as part of your team. Number two, their biggest reason is talent. If you think about today's market, correct? I don't know how many of you have tried hiring people in the today's market. It is a crazy market out there. The compensation packages are crazy huge. No, but you, do, you will not get a software engineer with less than $150,000. Now think of yourself as a your small business. Can you really afford spending that kind of cash right off the bat? You're crippling yourself, correct? So one of the good ways to incentivize those people to join your business is stock options, right? Where you give them options where they believe in your company and they know it's going to grow 10 times. So automatically that's an incentive and a way to hire good talent. So that's one of the big reasons. The other reason is, again, if you're thinking about your, uh, as an example, you're an engineering company, an engineering business, you want to hire some engineering advisors, scientists, or et cetera, but you do not want to pay them because again, it all stems to the fact that as a growing business, you want to not spend too much of your cash paying people out and incentivize them with something else. So then they use options as a method of payment even to your advisors, to your consultants. The other reason, if I'm the owner and I say, hey, Charlie, you want to join my board as an advisor, but I'm going to give you options. If he says no, you kind of, it, it, for me, it's a way to check him out to see how much he believes in my me and my company and my team. If he's ready to take the options as an incentive, as a package, then I know he believes in my company, he's going to support the growth of my company. So it works like a two-way street, right? Uh, the other one is doing m and a lot of venture capital, a lot of investment firms will ask you a question. What do you have for your employees? What are you giving them? How are they going to believe, be with you on the, for the long ride? What is it there for them to you know, build your culture of the organization, correct? They always ask you to take a portion of your equity and allocate it to common stock, like options, stock options. They like that, they find that, oh, you've thought through all that. You're thinking about your employees, you're thinking about the long term of your business. You want to set the right tone and messaging in your business. So it becomes very attractive for VCs and investment firms, plus as an M&A target, because they don't have to deal with giving extra compensation when they're acquiring you to those people. Any questions? I'll, I'll, any questions so far, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, in the early stages of a startup, when you're bringing on another co-founder, I know with like most more established companies that, that are profitable to some extent, um, if you join, say as a software engineer, your stocks will usually best over a four year period. But uh, as a co-founder, do you have that same vesting schedule or is it on a shorter term? The vesting schedule, so great question. And we are going to talk about it, but I'll give you a quick answer to that, right? So as a startup, you will your stock options will always come with a vesting period, be it two years, three years, four years, depending on what your board and your shareholders have agreed upon, correct? And you can sometimes say, okay, it vests immediately at 25% or 30% or something, but then it loses the incentive you're trying to promote with it. Correct? Because you want to build accountability, you want that person to be retained for a long time, and that's why the vesting schedule works in that behalf. Because you give them everything up front, they're like, what the heck, and he leaves tomorrow, there's nothing to hold him back. Correct? So the vesting schedule works as a way of keeping both the piece, like, you know, him believing in the company and us as, you know, as an employer, as an employer to retain them for a long time. And the same thing applies to our co-founder. Because again, one of the rules of what we believe in startups is never hire a friend. Right? And if you hire a friend or somebody else who you know, stock options is a way to you know, compensate them for what they bring in as an equity, but then you're keeping them accountable for what they're delivering to the business. So yeah, the domestic schedule does work for that benefit. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah. So when do companies issue them? So you were thinking about, is anybody right now planning in their businesses to issue stock options? You are? So what are you planning? Have you issued already or are you planning? Uh, well, we don't have stock, um, but currently what I've been doing is when people invest time in, I'm giving them a, an equity pool that's getting tracked in my accounting for the value of the time that they put in. So okay. the idea is when we do something that becomes a convertible event, um, they would get compensated back for that and it could be a stock. It could be a stock. Okay. Yeah, so no, that's awesome. But what made you, what was your trigger when you decided to do that? Uh, the same things, trying to get good people to give me time and 
trying to get advisors. To get advisors on that, yeah. correct, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So yeah, so multiple reasons, right? The biggest need, what we have seen and what we understand is for startups and early stage companies is cash flow needs, correct? Your cash flow needs is what triggers you to say, okay, you know what? Out of me as being a single founder or being maybe two founders, now I'm ready to part, you know, partake with some of my equity, correct? Out of the 50% pool I have, he has 50%, I have 50%. I'm now okay, I need to get 10% out of it so that I can start hiring my team now. Start getting, growing my business because there's only so much runway two people can do to grow the business. You need the right people to come on board, you need the right advisors. So that's when you need to decide, okay, do I give 5%, 10% out of my, my equity holding and allocate it to people who I really believe in and who I want to bring to the table. So that's when you think about it. Because again, otherwise you're spending 200,000 or you're not competing or you're not going to get the right talent into your building, you know? The other big reason is key leadership management, right? Again, you want to, you're ready at this point where um, you've got your initial seed money, correct? You've got your product market fit, and now you're ready to get the next key person, your next, you know, right hand person into the thing, like a COO or a CMO or, you know, whoever that next person needs to be. The biggest, uh, the best way to incentivize them to join you is equity options, stock options, right? Compared to cash. You have to give them some amount of cash, but the real reason they, you want that kind of key level people to join you is because they, they're going to support and drive the growth of your business along with you. So that's another reason why. Uh, talent growth, correct? Again, what we just talked about, scaling your business, hiring the right people, hiring the crazy number of engineers, crazy number of salespeople, that's a great way to give options. That's when people decide to do it. Um, new money requirements, as I said previously, a lot of VCs and a lot of in angel investors, the first thing they ask you is, what are you doing for your employees? And they say, okay, are you having a pool allocated for options in the future? And the reason they also do this is not just for the culture of the organization, it's also for their, their personal reason, right? If I'm an investor, I, do, I want you to have the allocation done right now. Because my percentage of what I'm investing is going to be based on what's already allocated, my capital base. But if I decide to do it after two years, it basically means as an investor today, I'm going to lose some value on my stock because I'm sharing that with another group of people. And I don't want my stock to be diluted. So that's another reason why they ask you to say, do you already have it allocated? Because they don't want to do it as a post event. They want to have it at that point so that they know exactly what they're getting into. And then, then from there, it's no more dilution because of options. Does that make sense? All right. How do companies issue them? Okay, before I jump to this, any questions on any of that so far or any other thoughts which have come up? Feel free to make it, you know, keep sharing because this is, there's no nothing like a, a, a dumb question. Mm -hmm. I'm serious because this topic is. A little more, you know, it's a little more complex and intense. So each of you may have your own situations of what you've read. So do share it with us so we can address those questions. All right. So how do companies issue them? So when you decide to issue stock options or equity options, correct? The very first thing you'll have to see is look back at your stock agreement, right? Your founder's agreement, your LLC agreement, or your uh, incorporation agreement to see what kind of authorized capital you have. What do you want to do? Think about your, look at your financial model and your projections, saying, okay, what am I planning? What are my big milestones happening? Who am I going to be sharing my equity with as part of that plan and the business plan that you have, correct? And then you map it out on a cap table. Some of you may have heard of the cap table, correct? Cap table is basically a model which represents your whole equity structure and who are the different players in that equity structure. Correct? You map it out and say, okay, my next big milestone is going to be that, oh, I'm going to commercialize next year. If I'm going to commercialize, who do, who do I need? What am I needing? Do I need to share any of my equity to any of those players in that? You put a line item for that. So basically, you start building your building blocks for your cap table. And that will tell you, okay, how much of it is left or how much of it is do you want to allocate for options. But the thought structure needs to be mapped out along with what your financial model is and your business model. They have to go all together. Because what happens is you may arbitrarily say, oh, you know what, I'm the 100% owner, I'm ready to give 20% today. It's all mine, it's okay. But that's not how you want to do it because that's a decision based on emotions and not thinking through what the value will be over time. And who all do you have to share your equity with, correct? So it's very important to think through your model and structure it such a way and map it along with your business plan for the next couple of years. 
So that at the end of the day, you, this is your company, this is your business, you have a plan for them. Either you want to grow it into a crazy big company or you want an exit which is like an IPO or to sell it to somebody. But you as an owner, you'll say, okay, what do I want to get out of it at the end of that, at that particular event? And then work backwards with that thought process to share your equity. Uh, the next one would be is then once you have a recommendation, and I, and not because we are a financial advisor, but I always recommend founders and uh, <coughs> startups to work with some advisors when you're thinking about your equity structure. Because it's difficult when you are so in the detail, you're so much in your business, to step out and think objectively. Correct? Sometimes you may not make a rational decision saying, oh my god, it's my equity, I do not want to give anything of it because I know there's a lot of value to it. Right? So you get tied and caught up with your emotions. You want somebody to think out objectively for you and give you the right suggestion. So work with whoever that advisor is, be it your legal advisor, be it, you know, a friend or, you know, maybe your family member, right? But always get that objective view to say, okay, should I be sharing a percentage of my equity? And I'll tell you this, yesterday I was talking to one of my clients and I'm like, he's at a point where I'm like, you need more money. You need new money coming in to grow right now. He's at that point where he needs new money to grow. But I said, okay, now is the point for you to start thinking about whether you want to give some percentage of yours. He's 100% owner right now. He's like, I don't want to give my equity. I don't want to give my equity because I know this has thing. And um, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. That was his word. I'm not there yet mentally to give my equity away. And I'm like, you're looking at time. You're looking, you need new money to grow. And then if you don't get new money and you don't get some advisors on you, you're not going to be hitting your milestones. So it's a very, it's, it's, it's a battle for a lot of founders to be able to give and release themselves to give that equity ownership. Okay, right? But that's when you do need an objective party at the table to help you through that, think through it. And that's what we have to do it with a lot of founders. Um, then the next step will be is once you decide what you want to recommend as an option pool allocation, you send that to your board or your shareholders or you know your other investors, get their approval on it. And then you work with your legal team to create the equity award plan document. The reason everything needs to be taken, uh, documented and written up is because a couple of years down the road, you're a big company, you're going for an M&A acquisition or you're getting a Series A funding. Those investors are going to work back and do an audit of all of it and do a due diligence on how you did and what you did. And they want to understand that you didn't arbitrarily come up with some number, you didn't give it to your uncle, your wife, your aunt, and your spouse. They'll do a whole backward mechan mechanics to understand what you did and how you did and why you came up with what you came up with. So the documentation and the thought process of what you did has to be all thoughtful and documented with your legal team. Plus, the, the rules keep changing, you know? Imagine your business is ready for an IPO. As an example, you're ready to go to the stage. The, the advisors, your IPO advisors, are going to go back and do an audit of the last three to four years of your business, which basically means all these documents need to be vetted and under the legal guidance. Uh, the next one is then you issue your award documents and then you can do it manually if you're just giving it to two people or three people. We, you know, we recommend that you get to be cash conservative. You do it you know, manually, you can get it. An advisor, your financial guy can do it for you. Or if you're giving it to a big group of people, we recommend tools such as Carta, uh, Morgan Share Stanley Shareworks, yeah. and some other tools like that to use that to then they automate it because it's efficient and just more effective to do it when you have a big group of people who you're giving it to. Yeah. And all of these companies, they do have good deal, uh, uh, they have good pricing options for startups. They actually have a segment supporting startups on those tools. Um, the next one is then you work with your plan administration team, which could be somebody in-house, or you get you know, somebody to do it with Encarta or uh, your financial advisor to administer that going forward, mm -hmm. basically. Because you may have people leaving, joining, changing, investing, you know? So all that needs to be cons constantly administered for tax IRS purposes. Mm -hmm. All right, so. All right, so you've determined, okay, I want to give someone stock. Um, now you have to think about, okay, what kind of option do I want to give them? So there's different kinds of equity compensation um, that you can give to your employees. Um, so the first one and the most common one is an ISO, and then you also see NQSO there. So the main distinction between those two is an ISO is for employees, so you can only give them to people that are employed by your company. Whereas an NQSO, you would be giving to, say, an advisor, a consultant, right? Um, so you couldn't give an ISO to a consultant, but you could give an NQSO. Does anybody know the full form of ISO? No. ISO stands for um, Incentive Stock Option. And, and uh, NQSO? Anybody? 
And he guesses, go wild, it's okay. It's all about <laughs> the room here. Non-qualified. Yes. There you go. Exactly yeah. You get another candy? What is going on? <laughs> 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 yeah. We're you want to give it a toss? Yeah. You ready? Yep. Oh. Not that. Decent. <laughs> we'll blame that on the throne. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, these are going to be the most common ones you see. Um, an important distinction is that ISOs and NQSOs are only for C corporations. So, um, if you're an LLC, you're going to see this down here, and we'll get to that. Uh, but C corps can issue these awards. Um, usually, there is a vesting schedule attached to these awards. Um, the vesting schedule, a lot of times, is time based. Um, mm -hmm. Three to four years, um, you can kind of choose how you want the vesting to actually go. And it, yearly, quarterly, um, et cetera. Um, but the most common ones, um, when you're thinking about giving out um, equity compensation, especially early in the company, is gonna be ISOs and NQSOs. Um, then we have RSA. Um, Sorry, but the normal, we, all, we normally see startups and founders and we ourselves recommend three to four years, and the reason being that your company is small, it's going to grow. So the people who you're giving it to, you want them to be here for a little longer time than a year or two year because then they're going to be able to add value to your business. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's a waste of time and a waste of you know, energy to even do it. Yeah. So that's what we say. So in case a question comes up, why can't I do it in one year or two years, right? That's always been the, you know, the response we give back is because what do you want from your employee? And there's also the option, especially sometimes we'll see this with NQSOs, is milestone-based vesting. Mm -hmm. So you could, instead of saying with a consultant, right, instead of doing like a three to four year vesting period or something like that, you could do a milestone. So you could say, provide this many hours of service or provide this project work for me or things like that. And that's how their um, options would vest rather than just being over time. So the, would, a, would a milestone have to be based on them individually or can it be based on a milestone for the company? Like you reach a certain point. It would, so I would say you would want it to be based on something that they have a direct impact on, right? So if it is a company milestone that they're contributing towards, then I would say yes. Um, because obviously if they're not accountable for the milestone, then they might feel it's a little unfair that their vesting is based off something they have no impact on. So you want to make sure whatever you do with milestone-based vesting is something that they have an actionable impact on and can make a difference on, so that way they feel like they're working towards that vesting, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, like, so like as an example, if mm -hmm. you had a salesperson um, yep. working towards a milestone of revenue, like company revenue, yeah. Like what they specifically need to bring in. Yeah, you could definitely do, we see that sometimes with ISOs, it's milestone-based vesting. You could say, we need to hit three million ARR by the end of the year. And if we do hit that, then X amount of shares will vest. Yeah, we see that especially with sales teams. We see a lot of milestone-based vesting because that, you know, ties their, you know, what they're working towards with compensation for that. And so and you can almost use this as a form of bonus structure in that way if you kind of use it. Correct. It can be multi-layered also, right? It can be two-pronged. You can you have an individual one metric and then a company-wide metric for the sales guy. Yep. So it can be two ways, right? So you can say, okay, if you hit your your individual milestone of this, you give them 5% or whatever the number is, as an example. And if you hit the company, if the whole team hits, then you all get X percentage in the pool. Mm -hmm. So it can definitely be two-pronged. Mm -hmm. Think about exactly like the bo what I said, like the bonus, right? Apply the same logic here and you can put it that way. Yep. The only big difference is bonus is immediate cash going out of the door. So you know the tangible value right away. Yeah. Your options will be based on your future value. Correct? Yeah. So again, your percentage may change, your mark will be changing, vary for it. Mm -hmm. But you can do both. Yep. So. And you can also do hybrid schedules. So you yeah. could do milestone and time-based vesting. So you know, if you didn't want all of your sales teams um, vesting to be tied to certain metrics, um, you could do, say, you know, half your shares are going to vest on a four-year period, and half your shares are going to vest based on these certain milestones. So you can get creative with how you kind of structure that and how you do vesting. Um, and you just want to make sure when you're thinking about vesting, it's all about incentivizing certain behaviors. So staying with the company, hitting certain goals, et cetera, right? So. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, sure. Sure. Too much on no, that. no, no, please. Um, so good. I'm all for incentivizing people to stay, and I think that makes sense early on. Mm -hmm. But I know that oftentimes businesses run into a point where people you start with aren't really the people you need once you hit those milestones. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, going a route like this means at some point, if you want them to exit the business, either they keep, they keep, like they still would have the option, right? So they, like, I'm curious about handling that. Right? Yeah. Does that mean now you have to buy, like, you buy it back, or they, or they exit the company as an employee, but they still 
for taking mm -hmm. ownership. So, yeah. yes. So, we're going to get into this in a little bit, but I'll talk about it. So, essentially, right, when we're talking about vesting, right, once um, shares have vested for an employee, they have a right to those. They have the option to exercise those. Um, and what that means is if they're exercising, they are purchasing those shares, right? So, usually when you give someone an option, there'll be a strike price attached to that. So say um, you give someone a thousand options, the strike price is $3, right? Um, at the time of exercising, if they wanted to exercise that a whole thousand shares, let's say it's completely vested, they would need to pay $3,000 to own those thousand dollar shares. So that's why it's called an option, right? They have the option to purchase shares at a future date. They're not obligated to, they don't have to buy them if they don't want to pay the $3,000 for the shares. They don't have to. Um, and an important thing is they only have the right to exercise what's vested as well. So let's say um, they have 1,000 shares, but only 500 have vested, and they leave the company. Um, upon leaving the company, that usually triggers a 90-day period that they have to exercise whatever shares have vested. So they've left the company, they have 500 shares vested, they can then make that decision, okay, do I want to pay $1,500 to receive those shares? Do I still think this company is going to be growing and there, there's going to be value in holding on to these shares? Or do I want to make the choice that, oh, hey, I'm no longer with the company, um, I don't want to purchase those shares for either, you know, I, I don't want to be part of the company in that respect anymore, or I just don't want to fork over the cash to do it. So that question. Is that true for all of these uh, stock options? Not for all. Not for all. No, okay. just this. Uh, this is just talking about ISOs. ISO that we give. Correct. So then, to your point, correct. So if somebody is leaving or you want them to leave, correct. So if following the vesting schedule, you'll have okay. They vested five hundred to Charlie's example. Mm -hmm. Then they can choose that ninety day period or whatever the period is to find out the agreement to exercise it. If they don't exercise it, then it comes back to the company automatically. It's permitted back by yep. the company. But whatever is not vested automatically comes back to you. Yeah. Right. Or you have the ability to add clauses and T's and C's in that stock option agreement saying, hey, if you're terminated for X, Y, Z reasons, it can be forfeited. But there's different things you can put in, yep. or if you join a competitor, you have the option to do yep. it. So you can define that, yep. you know? And that's, a lot of that's in the option agreement, you know, talking through if you're working with someone like a legal or financial advisor, they're usually talking through, okay, in these certain scenarios, certain terminations, you know, whether it was voluntary or non-voluntary, yep. what do you want that to be? Do they have forfeit it? Do they get to keep it and have that option to exercise? Right? So, yeah. It's up to the discretion of kind of you and your, your legal advisor, financial advisor, whoever you're working with to get your equity plan put together. And as you think of those T's and C's, the key thing would be, okay, what, because if somebody who's, who is giving that agreement to is smart enough and understands the options, they will look at the T's and C's and make sure they're planning their future also accordingly, correct? So that can become a negotiation item also. If a lot of their compensation is based on stock options, they can use that as a leverage to negotiate with you, saying, okay, I want it to be, I want 50% to be vested year one as a cliff, and the rest you don't forfeit, you know? So those becomes the T's and C's you play with, and you can define it, so. So that's ISOs and QSOs. Um, these other two are a little less common, but we don't see them as often, but companies do leverage them. Um, RSAs, so RSAs are actual shares received on the date of the grant. So on the date of the grant, they receive however many shares um, right then and there. So if you're saying, I'm going to give you an RSA, it's a thousand shares, you get that on the date of grant, those are yours. Um, and I don't know if you want to talk yeah. more on the so they are, So the RSA stands for Restricted Stock Award, correct? Mm -hmm. So they are normally, what we have seen the pattern is the Restricted Stock, stock Award is normally given to co-founders or key executives. Mm -hmm. The reason being that your RSA is an immediate grant, so you're basically, you become a stock, stock shareholder. Yep. You, you can get dividends, you can also have voting rights. Yep. So that's why it's normally given to the C-level suite people or your co-founders, right? And then the reason it's restricted is because it get, comes with a vesting schedule. So it's not that you know you can exercise it or you know you can uh, get the value of it if you leave or something. You have to do that ex the T's and C's associated with the RSA to make it unrestricted, which could be defined again by that agreement of what you want the T's and C's to be. But that is immediately given to you and you become a stockholder. Now you as a receiver of it, what does it mean for your tax perspective, correct? There is no tax implication for you if you file something what IRS is called is an 83B form. If you sign that 83B form, there's no tax implication for you on the date of the grant when you get those awards. 
So that's a one, one of the biggest advantages for the RSA. The only restriction is that you have to do all the other T's and C's to make sure that, that you know that the board vests with you at that end point. But the, immediately you're a stockholder of the company. RSUs, do you want to talk about? Yeah, so um, this is restricted stock unit. So um, this is a commitment to receive the value of a certain number of shares in the future. So the difference um, between an RSU and an ISO in this perspective is that when they exercise or when they're getting these um, shares, they don't have to pay anything. They're just receiving these shares. So that is one thing we see with ISOs is, right, like the employee, they have to pay that amount of money. They have to pay that $5,000, let's say, to get those shares. With an RSU, they are not paying to get those shares in the future, but it is a commitment. So they don't have the option. They automatically receive those shares um, in their name when they invest. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's used a lot more commonly in kind of later stage companies where, let's say your stock price is like $200 or $150 or something like that, and you even if you want to give someone like 100 shares, right, to actually purchase those shares, if you gave them an ISO, they would need $10,000, $20,000, $30,000 of cash on hand to be able to exercise those. So RSUs kind of allow for flexibility for when you're kind of getting into being a later stage company, um, to issue those to your employees and have them be able to participate and have options, but not have to worry about, okay, when I exercise this, the stock price is $200, I'm gonna have to pay so much money to actually get those shares. Because it's only valuable if they believe it's valuable, right? And if they believe, oh, when those do vest, I'm going to buy them. Otherwise, you know, it's not valuable to them. So the, key, the big thing with IRS use, right, it is definitely used for a later stage when your stock value or your fair market value is a little more, you know, appreciated. Mm -hmm. Because it is a straight compensation. Can I think about it as a bonus or a compensation because you as an employee do not have to pay anything for it. Yep. The only big thing you have to be concerned about is your tax yep. on your W-2s because there will be a tax implication when you get the RSUs. But the big, uh, the big difference between RSU and ISO is that ISO is, is an option for you to buy. RSUs, you can, it's, you're given it and it becomes yours. There's no option. They say, oh, I don't want this. You know, you, you get it as part of your package. Correct? And when you leave the company, the whole thing gets forfeited. No, no two ways to it. It gets forfeited. The company takes it back. Yeah. That's the big difference with an RSCO and an ISO. Yeah. And all of these have different tax treatments. Mm -hmm. um, a big reason why ISOs are so popular is they have the most preferential tax treatment. Um, so for the employees. For the employees. So that's why people like using ISOs for employees is usually from a tax perspective. It's not as bad. Correct. Yeah, yeah sorry, two questions. Uh, you said when you leave the company, the RSUs are forfeited? Okay. Even if they invested and you require them? Oh, so these are immediate commit. yes. And that's the whole thing with RSUs, correct. Even though they are, because the whole point of RSU is that you are supposed to be with the company for that. As long as you meet the T's and C's, then you become a stockholder. But if you leave before the T's and C's, then it gets forfeited. Okay, because I just had some bets, but I'm about to probably. Oh, is it, uh, were the RSUs? Yeah. Yeah, but did you meet all the T's and C's, all the yeah, remaining yeah, T's and C's? Yeah, then it's yours. All right, yeah. cool. But those T's and C's are the ones where the company really plays around with for the RSUs. But there's a tax implication, so there is a tax I need to declare the value at, of the stock at the time of um, me submitting my tax report? Correct, correct. Or, or at the time of receiving it? When, you, when you're submitting, so when you when invested with you, the RSUs? Yeah. And uh, actually, no, with the RSUs, when you've got the grant, you need to declare it. Okay. So if they go up by then, if the company's valuation goes up, a lot of them. Yes. Then I need to yeah. This is, for <laughs> RSUs, for you as an employee, it's treated as an ordinary income tax. Okay. So when you get it, you declare it. Yeah. Okay. As so a value. Bonus. So as a $200 example, that becomes your value for 200 times 10 or whatever you got. Correct? So you declare that on your, your, on your return. And it's treated with the RSA. It's not treated like an ordinary income tax. So you don't show it. You show it as a capital gains tax. So basically, what that means is because the whole preposition of the RSA is that you're going to be here for a long time, and it's going to be two to three years. So there's no ordinary income tax treatment. It's a capital gains treatment. But that's another reason why people like RSAs over RSUs because in the RSA, a tax rate for a capital gain is less than an ordinary income tax rate. So that's another reason why the person receiving it likes it when they speak to the tax advisor. Yeah. Just to be clear, the RSU is you're not actually receiving the stock today. Correct. Okay, so the tax implication comes with when you actually receive the stock. 
So with the RSC, you have to declare it when you've been given the grant because you can choose to defer it or pay it right away because your value is decided on that day. Okay. So, okay. PIUs. And did you have a question? Yeah, um, I guess I misunderstood the whole thing. So with an ISO, I thought you were getting the option to buy the stocks at a previously agreed upon price. Yes, exactly. Okay. And so, yeah, uh, because you just gave that example, you know, in later stages, if you want to give them 100 shares, now it's doing, now, now they need 20 or $30,000. Yeah, but what I was saying is that they don't have any options yet. This is like a new employee coming under the company. The company's grown a lot. It has a high strike price. It's, okay. it, the shares are kind of it's probably going to be like larger value for each one. So it's harder to give them, say, a thousand shares at a $200 price than say at a so, so the previously agreed upon price would be based on the current value correct but on the date of the grant on the yeah. date of the grant so if i'm giving okay. you uh, ISO, isos today correct and i say okay my strike price is five dollars so for you when you exercise it you're going to just pay me five dollars yeah. for that share yeah. but that when you exercise it which is done four years the value of my company could be hundred dollars mm -hmm. so instead of paying hundred you're only paying five so you're right. getting a big bargain correct so your tax is only on the five and not the thing okay. does that make sense yeah but that's the difference between RSUs. Is it like a think of RSUs like a bonus because that value is at two hundred dollars, and that's why it's a later stage company kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And then we have PIUs. So these are profit interest units. So um, as we said above, right? ISOs and NQSOs only C corps can issue them. PIUs or profit interest units um, are usually issued by LLCs, um, and they work as a form of profit participation. They're Similar in structure to ISOs, there's different tax implications on PIUs than ISOs, but they structurally they're very similar to ISOs, just for LLCs. Do, do, do you want to understand the reason why there was a PIU created for LLCs? Like, do you know the difference between the INCOP and the CCOP and the LLC structures for tax? Okay, so the CCOP has common stock, correct? Everything is in shared in stocks. With an LLC, it's all, we don't have common shares. There's nothing called common shares in an LLC. It's units, it's membership units. A person joining an LLC is considered a member, not a shareholder, not a common stockholder. So the reason why the, uh, the, the brilliant minds came up with PIU is saying, okay, we want to invite other members also to the LLC, but we can't give them ISOs. So can we come up with an instrument which provides for the similar benefit, but for an LLC? But it's still like, would it still be an option? So you said it's similar to the... It is an option, yeah. okay. yes. So they would still have to purchase. They will, the PIUs will yet have to be purchased, correct. It's a similar thing. But what you're purchasing and what your spread is going to be is based on the profit. So as of the PIU today, same same logic. Yeah. Your value of, your, you're basing it on the value of the business and you're saying your profit is $10 today mm -hmm. and your profit grows of the business to 20. The spread of $10 is what will be your value, incremental value. But this is based on a share price. This okay. is based on the profit of the company, of the LLC. At the time when you would give them the option Correct. to buy the PI, Correct. not when they actually... Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. The, base, the basic concept is similar. It's mm -hmm. just that it's a different instrument and what is the denominator is different compared to a share price and, you know, a profit. So. Is a PIU, is that similar to like the profit sharing kind of Yeah, that you absolutely. Okay. Correct. It's exactly similar to profit sharing. So a lot of businesses do profit sharing where they say, oh yeah, I'm going to give you 20% if you hit X thing, correct? Yeah. PIU works in a similar form, yeah. correct? But then again, it varies and it changes. So, you know, like a profit sharing every year, you're saying, okay, I'm going to give you a profit share of X percentage if you hit this, this milestone. Mm -hmm. A PIU can be a little more balanced and a little more long term in the sense that you will you'll take it step by step and not give immediately the 20% profit share. You're giving them maybe 5% year one, 5% the next year. You know what I mean? Okay. So it's a little more mellowed down version of a profit share. Okay. And it could be like milestone based, I guess? Absolutely, yeah. it can be okay. milestone based. Yeah. And that's a, a revenue or net profit? Very good question. It's definitely profit and you can define the profit. You can choose to make it a gross margin, you can choose it to be net profit, you can choose EBITDA, you can choose that. That is up to the company thing because the profit can be defined by you, but it's not revenue. With the PIU, are they a member of the LLC and therefore an owner? No, okay. they're not. So let me take a look. They're a member, but they're a non-voting member. Okay. Oh. So. so it's a way to do the profit share without giving them a exactly. membership. Exactly. 
But see, and see, the, the interesting part is a lot of people don't spend time thinking about what all it means and how the technical aspect of it is. But then it's like, oh wow, I'm, I am an owner of the. It's giving, it's building that optics and perception that I'm an owner of the business because I've got these units. So there's a lot to play with optics, a lot of perception played into there. Plus, they are also getting a value as the business grows. Right. So it works kind of, you know, that way. Yeah. But uh, but definitely not uh, voting. Now again, you might choose to say, okay, because it's an LLC, you have more more um, more flexibility in how you want to define what you define compared to a C corp. You can say, you know what, I want. You can give preferential treatments on it. Say, oh, I want to give this group of people PIOs which have X Y Z rights. The other group of people X Y Z. But then again, that will come into communications to the different people. Why are you giving them different type of things? Mm -hmm. And what again goes back to what type of culture and tone you're creating, and what are you trying to get out of it? Can I ask a question sure. about something I've heard of? That is, yeah. So I think this is more of an ownership structure versus a stock option, mm -hmm. but I'm curious how this is different from like an ESOP. <laughs> we were talking about it this morning. Okay. Yeah. So um, ESOP, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go too much into the details because that's a crazy, a little more complicated, but ESOP, the whole reason is different is because in the ESOP, you're basically giving your employees active participation in the governance of your company. Mm -hmm. In this, the employees don't have a active, active participation in the governance of the company. That's the biggest difference, okay. right? But when you think about the profit sharing, it is similar. ESOP okay. is also profit sharing and revenue and everything, mm -hmm. but they play a very active role in driving what you're doing with the company. Okay. Because so they become voting and you can, they can decide, you know, mm -hmm. what is structuring. They can question your moves, you know, as a founder, they can do all that in ESOP structure. So ESOP is really like a democracy, like you're building a democratic, you know, set, set up there. Compared to this, yeah. this is a way to distribute profits or ec like equity without without having it. exactly. And I think a lot of because as an early stage startup founder, if you have too many chickens in the thing, you, you yeah, know, it's going to be crazy. You already have enough to deal with, correct? Mm -hmm. right? So, what but a lot of people do do ESOP because ESOP helps them get employees. Yeah. So we are starting to see ESOP grow right now with, with uh, a lot of small businesses. Yeah. Because the prime reason is again, it's so difficult to get the right people onto the team. And an ESOP is an employee stock ownership plan. Okay. And it, it fits with an LLC structure? ESOP can be with any structure. Mm -hmm. So, um, talking a little bit more about ISA. So we said, right, they're a tax preferred form of compensation. Um, for the employee, right, for the employee to get that preferential tax treatment, they have two things they have to do. They have to hold the option for two years from the date of the grant, and they have to hold the stock for two years from the date of exercise. So they get the, op they get the option, right, um, on say, you know, September 2022. They have to then at least hold that grant till September 2024, and then Let's say on top of that, um, they go ahead and exercise some shares in September 2023. Then on those shares that they exercise to get the preferential tax treatment, they have to hold on to they have to hold on to those and not sell them till September 2025. If you do sell them before that, let's say you know they bought the shares in September 2023, they sold them in September 2024, it's going to get subject to ordinary income tax, so they're not going to get the preferential tax treatment. So you do have to hold on to it from two years of exercise to get the preferential tax treatment, which is big for employees. That's one of the big incentives is that it's, the tax preferred. Yeah, it's actually the tax, the tax really plays a big part for the employees because, and that's one of the things which we, we recommend our founders and our board to put in the communication is make sure you speak to your tax advisors before you sign that agreement. Mm -hmm. Because again, you as an employee, depending on your personal tax structure, what's going on with it, you may choose not to exercise it. Right? Mm -hmm. Or you may not want to dish out, right? Because if you are already, if you're on a bracket on the on the compensation package, which is already in the higher bracket, you're already going to be dealing with EMT every quarter. Correct? Now you're going to type on the equity and the exercising of those options. It may kind of weigh you down with that. So a lot of employees sometimes don't like it because of the tax implications. So those are the things you definitely want to communicate when you issue those awards to them. Please speak to your tax advisor to make sure this makes sense to you. Then for the NQSOs, these options are not tax preferred, meaning they pay ordinary income tax on the date of exercise on that spread, right? So if you gave them the option and it was five dollars, and now the you know now your company's fair market value is ten dollars, they would pay on that five dollar spread between those ordinary income tax. Any questions on that? Or thoughts? 
Um, the only thing I'm, I'm curious about, and it, it's interesting to think about this as a startup because maybe it wouldn't apply, but the, com the complexity here for employees, like I feel like most of my employees would have no idea. Like they would not understand this at all and this would be really overwhelming. Um, which makes me think it's, I mean, really what you're saying, like really more targeted at an executive level or somebody who's probably at a certain point in our compensation that this is now a competitive advantage for them to go with you versus a different company. Um, because it's complex, like they're- It like, is complex. Most of my employees probably don't have a tax advisor. You know? Get that. And you know what, that's interesting to say that even in a company like Microsoft, the people all get options there, but I, I guarantee you 50% of those employees don't even know what it means to them, yeah. Yeah. right? Like when I was at Cardinal Health and we had options, we were given options. Obviously, I'm from the finance background, so I knew what it meant. But there were a lot of my other peers who did not know. So they were like just happy to see it on the thing. Oh, I'm part of the company. Yeah. So a lot of things is driven by what kind of culture you want to build. Yeah. But then again, it also is now people are getting more smarter because more startups are happening, more things are happening, and you hear about it, right? So they try to do their own little exercise with it. Mm -hmm. But you as a founder, I think, I do believe in options because it basically, you are giving them a fair treatment to what you're trying to build out here. Mm -hmm. In my mind, like so, yeah. yeah. I, I just would add on to it, as somebody who's received stock options, mm -hmm. uh, they're not worth anything today, but um, what I've had them do, the, the strategy is decided by the founders and the board, mm -hmm. but then once it's presented to the employees, you can bring in somebody to educate them in a 15-20 yeah. yeah. minute session, mm -hmm. and then they'll know what they need to know about their situation. Absolutely. And that, that's the big thing is education, right? It's only valuable if they actually think it's valuable, right? So. Yeah. And we do that. So we actually did that. Last two weeks back, we did present to one of our clients to their whole employee team yeah. about, hey, what, is, what does this mean to you guys? Yeah. And we were also actually repricing their awards based on the most recent Series A. And we explained to them, what does repricing mean to you? Why does it make sense? And what you should be thinking about repricing before you sign the repricing agreement. So the education is very, very vital. Yeah. So that they understand that you are giving them something valuable. So yeah. What's it worth? Okay. So going back to what it's worth, and we kind of covered this a little bit, but uh, in terms of you now to uh, to restate what we've been saying is like a stock option is the reason why stock options are an attractive way of compensating anybody in your know, in your team is because you're giving them a right to purchase something which is going to be super valuable, but at a bargain. So you're basically buying a, tes a Tesla today. At 50,000, which could, according to Tesla people, it, it only appreciates to 100,000. Correct? So you're giving them at 50,000 compared to 100,000, but they have to buy in two years. So that's exactly what a stock option is. Yeah. So right? it's, it's all about the spread between the strike price you give them when you give them the option, right? So you say, set it at $5, and say, five years from now, your company is worth $100 a share. Then when they sell those shares, if they went ahead and exercise, they make that $95 spread, right, on all of those. So it's all about the spread between your strike price and where your stock price ends up in the future. That's where the value is. Now you as an employee may ask questions, and you are allowed to ask questions, may you have been communicated this, right? Okay. Share with me what you think about the projection of the company, right? You can ask them the question, like as an employee, say, okay, why do you think this $10 is going to become $100? So because you're basically getting, even though it's a non-voting right, you yet have to understand what you're getting in return for what you're giving to the company, correct? And only if you believe in it, that's when you can decide to exercise your options. Mm -hmm. And that's why the beauty about options is it's all up to you as an individual if you want to hold yourself to that tax implication or not. Yeah. And so, you know, if an employee thinks, oh, this company is going to be worth $200 a share one day, like this is a great opportunity for me, like there's going to be a huge spread, then that's awesome. They'll probably buy in, um, and then they'll probably buy into the company culture and things like that a lot too. Um, you know, if the belief is, oh, this is you know like three dollars in five years, like there's not much value here, then the, you know they might not be as excited about this as a form of compensation. So it's also making sure your team is aligned with the expectations for future growth, and then they feel like this company is going to be growing along with them. So. And to add to that, right? And I'm thinking what I'm implying. So it. It also holds the founders accountable. Because if you want your people to stay, you need to mm -hmm. deliver those results. Yeah. Otherwise, they can leave. Yeah, it helps with accountability you, both It's ways. both ways, right? So it's a two-way street when you think about options. And again, it goes back to, OK, you as a founder, what are you trying to create? Who are the people you want on the right? So what does it mean for the investors on the cap table? you want to go ahead? Yes. Yeah, so what does it mean for investors on the cap table? So. Right when you have this equity compensation, you're essentially, as Arthi alluded to earlier, 
taking a certain percentage of your stock and setting it aside for options. So you're saying 10% of my company's stock is only gonna be for options. Um, everything else is gonna be owned by investors, founders, etc. But no one can touch this 10%. Um, once you've kind of carved out this pool, that is what you're giving options from. So let's say you, know, you, you, do a, you have a million shares, you decide, okay, we're gonna do a 10% pool, you know, 100,000 of those shares are gonna be for our equity. Um, and you say give 10,000, and now you have an employee that's coming on, and you wanna give them, say, 10,000 shares, you would allocate that against the pool. So now you have 90,000 sitting in your pool, and you have 10,000 that have been allocated to one of your employees. And so you continue as you bring on employees to use that pool until you get to a point where, oh, okay, we're almost out of shares from the pool. Do we need to think about increasing the pool size so that we can give out more options? Um, and then obviously with increasing the pool size, you then have to talk to your investors because that causes dilution for any current investors. And so that's why a lot of times when new investors are coming in, they want you to increase that pool size before they give you the money so they're not gonna get diluted when you do it. Um, so it's a common ask when you get new investors to come into your company, they're gonna say, hey, what's your equity pool looking like? You know, is this gonna hold you for the next three, four years? Are you gonna be able to give out the options you need? Or do you need to increase this now? Because we don't want to you know, put our money in now and uh, five months from now, the pool runs dry. Sorry guys, we need to increase the equity pool so that we can give out more options, you're gonna get diluted. So they wanna make sure your equity pool has enough bandwidth to um, give out the options you need to over the next couple of years so that they don't get diluted right away. Okay. The other thing you may think is, oh, why don't I just increase my authorized capital and get expand that, correct? But would it make sense to increase your authorized capital every so often? That's a question for you guys. Mm -hmm. And authorized yeah, capital is like the total number of shares, shares. you can have. No, because you're diluting everyone's okay. supply, right? Basically, and at the end of the day, if you're getting ready for your next, uh, if you're deciding to have an exit round, your whole share price is gonna be based on your authorized, you know, what your issued and authorized baseline mm -hmm. is, which basically means you are, you know, it's just reducing your value in totality. So some people have asked me, why don't I just ex increase it? Yeah, it's super easy to increase it, but what does it mean for you? Like, is it good to, you know, you're reducing your own internal value. By doing that. Do you startups ever do buybacks from employees? Do startups do buybacks? Or is that only when you go public? No, you no. So buyback is a public thing, right? Because you buy back from your company, a lot of their bank holders. When you use buyback in a startup term, it's basically you're repurchasing them, correct? So if I'm an employee who has stock and I'm leaving today, you can give the option saying, hey, I can buy back your stock if you don't want to hold it. That's the only way, like a buyback in a startup. But otherwise, the if the buyback term you hear outside is more for a public company, but yes. Yeah, and so um, what, what does it mean for the investors? Why do they like them? Um, it provides stability for company personnel so they know that key members are gonna be staying on board, right? You're not gonna lose your CTO, your CFO, someone like that, right? It, it's incentivizing them to stay with the company so it keeps key members on board. Um, creates accountability and ownership culture within the company so um, you're, being more accountable to your goals, to your, you know, we want to hit this revenue, we want to do this number of clients, et cetera, right? Um, so it helps drive that. Um, investors like it because it helps retain folks, so you're not turning over employees all the time. Employees are more likely to stay. Um, and then also, options are non-voting in nature, so they don't have to worry about any of these people voting or going against them, what their vision of the company is because they're not voting in nature. Good. Uh, one of the first things when you're doing your pitch, correct, to investors, they're going to be asking, because as an early stage company or a mid-sized growing company, one of the things the investors are looking for in your pitch is basically saying, okay, who is the team supporting this guy? They're, they're putting their money on the team and the, your, obviously your offering, correct? But it's really on the team who's driving that business. Because they're saying, okay, I'm putting $100,000 today, I'm expecting, everybody's here for the money, even though they say, oh, we believe in you, blah, 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 it's all in for the money, no two ways to it. That's, you know, we, we tend to kid ourselves about it, right? So they're looking at the team driving the, the engine behind. So for them, that is a very important thing for them to understand that, okay, what are, we, what are we doing to retain those people and are those the right people? They can definitely come down tomorrow and say, I don't like a CTO, have them go away. So they will look at those option agreements as part of their due diligence to make sure that the T's and C's are flexible enough to give them, you know, exit out also. And I know we're running a little short on time here, so I just want to make sure you yeah. can kind of see this visual, is that here's where that value piece comes in. So you can see your zero, you give this employee 
thousand shares at five dollars. The strike price is five dollars. Um, and on the date of the exercise, right? Uh, sorry, on the date that you grant it, right? The fair market value that you're giving them, that strike price, is always going to be the same as the current fair market value of the company. So there's no spread there. There's no value on the date of the grant. But as time goes on, you'll see, oh, okay, this stock price is increasing. After four years, right? I have my strike price of five. Um, I have my FMV of 40, so the stock of the company is worth 40 now. Um, all the thousand of my shares have vested, so that spread, that $35 spread between the $40 and the five, the value is $35,000 if I sell those shares right now. I just made $35,000, all because I got these 1,000 shares. So obviously you can see, you know, as this FMV number goes up, as the number, if you have more shares and invested, there can be a lot of value there a lot of upside for um, people that own options. And that, that is where a lot of the value is at. There can be a lot of upside with the growth of the company. Yeah. I think that's it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we'll be, we'll be sticking around. If anyone else has questions, feel free to come grab some candy up here. And yeah, thank yeah. you guys for being such great participants. One more question, yeah. right? The fair market value is what it is. If you want to exercise your options and then turn around and sell it, who is going to buy it? Who's going to? So you usually have to, for the most part, right, you're going to have to wait for the company to either go public or be you know, bought out, um, some sort of M&A situation, something like that where someone is going to be purchasing your shares. Otherwise, right, as a private company, let's say you exercise your shares, like I have like a thousand shares now, right, you're going to have, you would have to find someone within the company, right, to buy those shares off you. Otherwise, Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> there you go. It's a list of you can have investors, you can have angel investors who are looking at the company, but it's going to be a network of yeah. people you talk to. And get but they're, they're pretty ill, Ill liquid until you go private and exactly. there's some sort of event like that. So, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys. Thank you.